But I want to set the record straight on life today for our students and for all of us today. I want to set the record straight because sometimes the world teaches and sometimes even the church teaches that if you do everything right, life will be easy. And you'll just coast through and you'll be full of blessings. But the, but the honest truth is life is hard. If you're here today and you can attest to that, just say amen. amen. Life is not easy. If you think that what you have been through as college students and as high school students has been hard, <laughs> welcome to the world. See, you haven't reached the end, you just reached the end of the beginning, and now the real stuff starts. In this room today are people that have endured divorce, people that have been fired from jobs, people that have failed trying to start businesses, people that have been hurt, people that have had sickness, people today who are fighting cancer. In this room, you've had people who have fought bravely for their country and endured all kinds of hardships. You've had people who have battled depression. In this room today, you have people who have actually lost children. Life is not easy. But the Bible tells us that when we realize that life is hard, it's not because we've made some kind of terrible mistake. When we realize that life is hard, it's not because God doesn't love us. When we realize that life is hard, we understand it's part of God's purpose for what he wants to accomplish in our lives. If you have your Bibles with, me today, with you today, open your Bibles to James chapter 1, verse 1. This is near the end of the New Testament. James is a brother of Jesus. James was the leader of the church at Jerusalem. James, it's said of James that he was a man of great faith and faithfulness, that he was actually called James the Just. It's said of James, the brother of Jesus, that he prayed so much that there were thick calluses on his knees. He would not win the bonny leg contest. It says his knees looked like the knees of camels. James was so faithful to Jesus Christ that they took him up to the top of the temple to renounce Christ, and he would not, and so they threw him off the temple. The fall did not kill James, and still he did not renounce Christ, and they began to stone him and beat him to death, and as he was beaten, he prayed for those who were attacking him. And here's what James says as he begins his letter. James, these folks would sign their letters at the beginning. It makes sense. Don't you hate to read a whole letter and wonder who it's from? And you have to go all the way to the end and say, okay, it's from this person, go back to the top. He just simply says, James. And so here is James, the brother of Jesus, writing to us, and he says, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Greek culture, it would be, a, it would be an insult to be called a bondservant. They valued freedom like we do today in America. And it's no small thing that he calls himself a bondservant of God. He considers himself a servant of God to the end. And... He says that he's a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's amazing that he doesn't say, my brother. It's amazing that he doesn't inter introduce himself as the brother of Jesus. He introduces himself as a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Greek word for Lord is kurios. And really right here it means that he's a servant of God, Jesus Christ. And he writes to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. This is a general meaning to the church to the Jewish people who are scattered all over the world, and he gives his greetings. And then he starts right away. And so there must be a burning purpose on his heart to get right into the meat of this letter. He gets right to the point because there's a problem. And here's the problem. Verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Students, don't you want to be perfect? Don't you want to be complete? Don't you want to be lacking nothing? I got to tell you, when you're talking about perfection in school, and I just want you to look at me. I was not perfect. But boy, that's a good goal to aim towards. And so here we see that he says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Here this word trials is an important word. 
It means pain. It means suffering. It means testing. It means difficulties, struggles. And what kind of doofus is James? Count it all. Joy? No. You know what we should do, don't you? You know what we should do when trials come? We should whine. Why don't you just try it with me right now? Let's just want. <laughs> we should complain. I don't know why we deserve the da 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 da. Actually, James is blowing the lid off the uh, whole entire thought of Jewish life. In Jewish life, they thought if you're really good, if you do the right thing, if you work really hard, you will have nothing but blessings. Tiptoe through the tulips. <laughs> but this is exactly what the people who came to Job when he was having his hard time. You remember Job in the Old Testament? He, he, was, he was a righteous man. Satan comes to God and says, I bet you he won't praise you if he loses stuff. He says, take away his stuff. He loses all of his stuff and he still praises God. Satan says, I bet he won't praise you if he loses his family. God says, take all of his family but leave his wife. Later on, we find that keeping his wife was actually worse than losing her, apparently. <laughs> and so he still prays. He said, he said, I bet he won't praise you if you let me strike his body. And so he has these boils on his body. Let's just think about that before lunch, won't you? All right? These big, gross, pussy boils that he's scraping off with rocks and stones. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? And still he praises God. You see, he was going through trials. And so we see that trials will come. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. I want you to understand today, James regards trials as inevitable. He says when, not if, you fall into various trials. Listen, graduates, at some point in time, you will have trials. They will come. Some of you have already been through it. Some of you have struggled in school with temptation. Some of you have struggled with your grades. Some of you have struggled with your friends. Some of you have struggled with being overlooked or made fun of. Some of you have struggled in your homes during this time. Mom and dad have struggled. And as Ken said, some of you have struggled with loss. But it will continue to come. What we want to see here is this. Faith is tested through trials, but it's not produced by trials. I want you to get that again. Faith is tested by trials. Say that with me. Faith is tested by trials, but is not produced by trials. No. Faith doesn't come through trials. It's only revealed through trials. If trials don't produce faith, then where does faith come from? Romans 10, 17 tells us exactly where it comes from. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Would you say that with me? Faith comes by hearing hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith is built in us as we hear and understand and trust God's word. Friends, here at this church, a tremendous amount of our resources goes into children's ministry, into youth ministry, pouring into our kids because we know that the word of God produces faith. And let me say to all of us here today, and especially to you graduates, if you are not hearing the word of God, if you are not studying the word of God, if you're not around people who are pouring into you the word of God, holding you accountable to the word of God, living as an example before you the word of God, you will not have the faith required to accomplish the purpose of God. Listen to that again. You've got to be in church. My hardest years of college were my first two years when I was in and out of churches. And then I got involved in the church, and I was there all through, and I've never missed hardly a Sunday since. You must be somewhere. Listen, adults, if you are irregular in your church attendance, you are harming yourself. You will lack the faith required to fulfill God's purpose in your life. You've got to be reading the Word, studying the Word, growing in the Word. We have given you, we have given you resources, even today, to help you grow in your faith. We count it all joy. What is James talking about? I remember my geometry teacher. He would pass out a test, and here's what he would say. 
This is an opportunity for advancement. Christian's going to the Navy. Christian, you're going to have one test after another, and those tests are opportunities for promotion. And you will not like the test very much, but you will be glad to have the opportunity for the results. That's the way it is, isn't it? God gives us tests to prove our faith and our faithfulness. And though we don't enjoy the test, he's not saying here, whenever hard times come, say, yay! He's not saying when your grandmother dies, oh, wow, that's awesome. He's not saying that. He's not saying that when you're struggling. He's not saying that when you're sick. He's not saying that when you have loss, that you ought to just put a smile on your face and say, this is so good. No, what he's saying is, in the background, playing in the background of your mind, you should be thinking, God is accomplishing his purpose. God is accomplishing his purpose. And therefore, we can endure knowing that God is accomplishing his purpose in our lives. Trials don't produce faith, but when trials are received with faith, it produces patience. This is what James is saying. But this word patience is an interesting word. It comes from the Greek word hupomone. You want to sound really smart to your friends? Say, yeah, I've been working on my hupomone. You want to try it? Just try it. Look at somebody and say, hupomone. I've been working on my hupomone. Hupo means under, and mone means weight. And so here is the idea that we are holding up under, and we're holding up under as long as it takes. We use this illustration when we talk about love. The, the definition of love, it says, love endures all things. And I use the illustration of a little donkey going in the Grand Canyon, and he has my wife's luggage on his back. Oh, my goodness. Oh my goodness, it was time for our honeymoon. And, and I hadn't seen her luggage until after the reception, I drive to the house of her mom and dad, and there in the front yard, covering the entire six acre front yard, <laughs> was luggage. I looked at the luggage, and I looked at my car, and back and forth, and thought, she can take all this luggage if I don't go. We crammed it all in, and the only reason we could cram it all in is because the car actually had a sunroof that I could open up and stick things up through. <laughs> now, I just want you to imagine that donkey seeing that luggage, and can you imagine his eyes? Woo! And that donkey has to go down into that Grand Canyon or up out of the Grand Canyon, and here is he, 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 hoopamones. He holds up under. And so patience here, this endurance, isn't as much as waiting in the doctor's room. It's, it's really the, it's the effort needed to finish a marathon. And so this was one of the great, one of the great uh, attributes considered by Greeks, is to be able to hold up under, that it was a queen of virtues. And so let me just see if I can illustrate this for you. Daniel's been practicing. He, he, he runs a lot. And now he ran, what was it, kind of a half marathon or something that you ran recently? It was a, it was a half a marathon. And, and did you finish it? Did you enjoy while you were running? The last three miles? They were terrible, yes. For me, the first three steps would be terrible. Dan, why, did, why did this doofus over here run a marathon if it's terrible? I'll tell you why. Because he wants to be healthy. He wants to be strong. He wants to be svelte and sexy for his wife. All right? He, what's that? He doesn't that. <laughs> and so, and so he runs. He runs almost every day. And, and, and in order to see how he's doing with his running, he allows himself to be tested in the marathon. You're a cheerleader. To me, it's the craziest thing that there's cheerleading competitions. Think about it. If there's a cheerleading competition, who's cheering for the cheerleaders? The football team? <laughs> that was called a herky, by the way. Right? I got it. Do you know why cheerleaders started a competition? Same reason bands started a competition, because you want to work on your 
skill on your craft, and in order to go into a competition, it helps you to see where you stand. It makes you work to improve. Listen, here's what James is saying. God is giving us the opportunity to see where we stand in our faith, to see how complete, how whole we are. And so we see then, trials come for a reason. And one of the reasons is that trials lead to endurance. Will you just say that with me? Trials lead to endurance. Daniel, Daniel can do that marathon. If I went out and tried to run a marathon, I would die. I am not joking. I've had a heart attack. That would be it. Unless, what? I was working on building up my strength. Half mile into that marathon, I'd be thinking, dear God, I am not in the shape I need to be. It would reveal where I am. Here we see that trials lead to endurance. He says that the testing of your faith produces patience as we see endurance. And so the work of patient endurance comes slowly and must be allowed to have full bloom. I'm going to just tell you something right now. Suffering comes in a lot of different ways. Trials come in a lot of different ways. And they come for a purpose. Listen to me, Paige, honey. Life's not always going to be easy. But the things that come down the road are for a purpose. Listen. <coughs> Trials help remove impurities from our lives. Helps remove indifference and self-trust and false motives. It helps, produce, it helps get rid of self-centeredness and wrong values and wrong priorities. Helps us to overcome our human defense and escape mechanisms where we try to handle our own problems. How many of you have tried to handle your own problems and realized one day, I can't do this? And so you say, Jesus, take the wheel. You see, this negative aspect accomplishes a couple things. When we are out of fellowship with God, suffering reminds us that we need to be in relationship with him. When, we, when we're in fellowship with the Lord, suffering becomes a loving and skillful handiwork of the vine dresser to make us more productive. It involves unknown sin, areas we may not be aware of, but that are nevertheless hindering our growth and fruitfulness. In this case, suffering or trials constitute mirrors of correction. When believers live under suffering joyfully, and that is they endure and keep applying the promises and principles of the faith, Christ's life and character will be more and more manifested as we grow through the suffering. This means trust, peace, joy, stability, biblical values, faithfulness, obedience, in contrast to the sinful mental attitudes of blaming and running and complaining and reactions against God and God's people. And so we see that, that, that trials lead to endurance. It helps us to overcome our sinful weakness. And then we see that one of God's purpose in the trials is that the patience then leads to completion. Will you say that with me? Patience or endurance leads to completion. How many of you like half-baked cake? You know, we, we, we don't want to just mix it up into a bowl and say, happy birthday to you. We want it with the decorations and the little flowers and, and the candles. We want it to be completed. Listen, God's not finished with anybody in this room. If you're still breathing today, he's not finished with you. But he will bring you to completion. Listen to what James says. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. None of us will ever be perfect this side of heaven, but the word here means complete, whole. Listen, patient endurance is a mark of the person who is perfect and complete. Jeremiah 29, 11, God has a purpose and a plan in what you're going through. Listen to what he says. I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Paul echoes this in Romans 8, 28. You know this, for we know that all things work together for the good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Jonathan, it's not going to be easy, buddy. Ministry is not easy. I know I stand up here and make it look like it's just the greatest thing ever. And it is. But listen, I'm going to tell you today, Jonathan, nothing of value comes easy. Nobody who wears 
a raw diamond on their fingers because it is the etching and the cutting that make it beautiful. Nobody wears a raw piece of gold rock around their neck because it's the refining and the process that make it precious. Nobody looks at a stone and says, wow, what a beautiful stone to put in my house. No, it's every etching, every carving, every scrape, and every polish that brings it into a masterpiece. That is what God is doing in our lives. He is revealing where we continue to need work and allowing us to see in the mirror of the areas where he's bringing change. Nothing that comes cheaply is valuable. 2 Timothy 4.8 Listen to this. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. God has a reason for your tests. Listen to me today. I want you to get this today. Life is hard, but it's worth it. Will you say it to me, with me? Life is hard but it's worth it. I gotta tell you, in the past weeks, months, I've struggled. I think I'm 50 years old, everything gotta be easy by now. I've, I've been to school half my life. I think I've been to school 137 years. I literally drove 100,000 miles back and forth to seminary. I mean, I, it ought to be easy. I raised these kids. They ought to be able to take care of themselves now. I've been married for 25 years. It should be easy now. <laughs> but apparently it's not. <laughs> and I got to tell you, on the days where I'm struggling, in the moments where there's pain, the times where my body doesn't work the way I want it to. When I don't have the finances to do the things I wish I could. When I grieve the loss of my mom. When I dread the leaving of my son. There's something playing in the background of my mind. It's the thing that keeps me going. God is at work in my life. And he is making me into what he wants me to be. Some in this room have failed tests, but all that does is reveal areas where we still need to grow, to rely on his word. Some have passed tests, but that takes us on to the next level. I think Steve Cook is now on level 257 of Angry Birds. Each level, takes him to the next level. It's a good thing he's married to Angie and she runs the business. <laughs> Remember we talked about Job and all that he went through? Here's what he says. In all of this trial, in all the suffering, in all the loss, he declares, I know that my Redeemer lives. And in the end, he will stand on the earth. Someday, our faith will end in sight. And if we endure, we will hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your reward. You've been through graduation ceremonies, you've received honors, but I'm gonna tell you, I don't think there's anything more important than what happens here today. Because the plan that God has for you is not just to be a nutritionist, not just to be an air traffic controller. The plan that God has for you is much greater than that. It's an eternal spiritual plan. And he is the great professor who will give you some tests here and there to help you see where you stand in his class. He's working on you. He's working on me. And so when you have the opportunity for advancement, Approach it and say, thank you, God, for revealing what I need to do and what you're going to do.